this is episode 12, Michael O'Kelly interviews Brendan. So we didn't skip interview six. So as I talked about in previous episodes, um, So we talked about this in past videos, the timeline. So he had his first interview here, second interview, third interview, fourth interview, and then along, you know, throughout 2005 and then again in 2006. So he's, at this point, we just finished the second part of his fifth interview with law enforcement. I cut it in half because it was a long interview, so I just did it in two parts. Um, but so we just completed that. That was March 1st of 2006. Now, the next day, Brendan is charged, arraigned, all that stuff. He's very shortly thereafter convicted. So in April, he's convicted. He's charged in March, and in April, he's convicted. That's very fast. All right, so Dassey is now going to be interviewed by, again, this is Len Kaczynski's investigator. So Len Kaczynski was the first public defender for Brendan before he got booted off the case for not doing a good job of defending client his client. So Dassey, um, for whatever reason, is interviewed without representation he's interviewed without you know adult supervision or without representation and all of legal representation in any of these videos this particular investigator for Len Kaczynski it almost seems like he wants to get a confession out of Brendan and it appears that way very much in that him and Len were both trying to work out a, some kind of get him to to confess somehow so um so we're gonna watch that and then after that comes the very next day comes Dassey's sixth interview with law enforcement if you think it's been excessive now we still haven't even finished he's about to be convicted or at this point let's fast forward to time that he is convicted but now we're about to have him interview with Mike Michael O'Kelly so in the span of less than two months, he's been arrested, charged, taken into custody, com you know, committed, um, and uh, convicted by a jury of his peers, which that is fast, guys. That's really fast. So now um, we're going to watch this interview with Michael O'Kelly, who doesn't, he's a polygrapher. So he's a polygraph expert, investigator guy, and that's what he's there to do, basically, is get a confession out of Brendan. At least that's what it appears he's doing. So let's, let's take a listen in. Let me swap screens here and All right, here we go. So this is... Again, he's already in custody, he's already been convicted by a jury, and now he's got to answer to this guy. And just watch the, just, oh, this angers me. Give me an idea what you think. That they might raise it or something? They might what? Raise the price. That's a possibility. Let's do this. I'm going to show you some things here that I'd lay out for you. This is your polygraph. Can you read up here? Can't see that far? Can you see what color it is? Okay. I'll read, well, read it for you. 
Sanity. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all those YouTube -y things. You know what? I, I forgot. I wanted to go into this article real quick before um, before we watch this. I this was interesting, and this was first time I found this, so this is something I had not heard before. So we're going to talk about some school records that come into play from the school psychologist. So um, Brendan had a file, so, and those records show that the school officials had not labeled Dassey as cognitively, cognitively disabled. They had him in regular as well as some special classes. His IQ tested higher than Stephen Avery's, which is interesting, in tests administered by the defense psychologist. Still, it was a low IQ, and he clearly had problems at the school all that the school also reportedly noted, um, especially when it came to uh, communication, which we're going to read right here. So Chris Schoenenberger Gro Gross was the psychologist at Mishicot High School. The school had a file on Brendan. One report said, according to trial testimony, quote, he exhibits difficulty responding clearly and concisely to others. Paragraph comprehension, defining vocabulary, and understanding age-appropriate vocabulary terms remains challenging. So language is challenging for him. And he was easily coerced into confessing, con confessing uh, in my opinion. All right, so Brendan will occasionally ask questions when he is unsure. However, eye contact and participation during discussions with adults and peers is limited. Brendan's memory specifically is affecting all areas of language. So he's got some memory problems too. Brendan continues to demonstrate delays at, in his basic reading, reading comprehension and language skills, both receptively and expressively. Brendan needs specialized instructions, which the regular education environment alone does not provide. He needs special education services and support to help him be successful in school and to meet his needs. Bam, right there. He needs special education services and support to help him to be a successful individual in the world. He needs help. All right, so uses minimal eye contact, gestures, and a variation of pitch in conversations in therapy and in the classroom, willingly participates in speech and language therapy sessions. Overall, Brendan demonstrates significantly delayed receptive and expressive language skills, memory, short-term memory, immediate memory, and working memory, vocabulary, sentence comprehension, pragmatics, and areas of abstract language. For example, idioms. Brendan's strengths are in his willingness to participate in speech therapy, uh, knowledge of fami familiar sequences, I don't know why that was, why that was so bad. Knowledge of familiar sequences and his articulation skills, okay. Brendan will occasionally ask questions when he is unsure. However, eye contact and participation during discussions is limited uh, with adults. Brendan is expressionless, no facial expression, seemingly blank stare, and possibly indicating daydreaming. Um, so he's expressionless, his, he has no facial expressions, he has blank stares, and can seem like he's daydreaming. Brendan was in regular classes at Michigan and some special classes in speech or language. Um, I guess according to testimony on the stand, Ken Kratz asked her, was he the kind of student that your school district considered cognit cognitively disabled? Asked Ken Kratz. She said no. 
and although he was getting some special classes in some in speech or language brendan pretty much um was a normal kid that is uh he went through normal classes in mishkat is that right she says yes he was tested on his thinking ability and scored 93, where the average person would score 90 to 109, so he did pretty well there. He was tested on his math skills and scored 100 to 102, which is really good, um, when the average was 90 to 110. He was in solid average range and wasn't a behavioral problem at Mishikot. The school had never noticed problems with Brendan being influ easily influenced. He read at a fourth grade level, and we knew that, that his uh, comprehension and reading was not that great, but he, it's also his language, language is a big thing when it comes to reading. If you can't read very well, then you probably aren't really good at grasping the language that you're speaking. On another test, he scored below average to borderline range in short-term memory abilities. A defense psychologist later administered IQ tests to Brendan. He found that Brendan's IQ was on the lower end of low average. An average IQ was 100, Brendan's IQ was 83, higher though than Stephen Avery's, which was reportedly 70. Um, oh yeah, this is good. Okay, so the psychologist Robert Gordon of Janesville, Wisconsin, also gave Brendan a test designed to measure suggestibility. Under pressure, how much would Brendan yield in his answers? Gordon found evidence of suggestibility. Brendan also scored high for social alienation and introversion. He was average on some measures. He was shy, deferential, and passive. On the suggestibility test, Brendan answered in a yielding fashion 8 out of 15 times. That is huge. If that doesn't show you how suggestible he is, how malleable his answers are, then I don't know how to explain that it was furthermore coerced, his confession. <laughs> He shifted his answers in 9 out of 20 potential questions. The test measured whether Brendan would shift his answer or yield to, measure, to mild pressure or mild criticism. That was higher than average. As an example of a shift yield in the March 1st interview, Gordon focused on passages like this one. Investigator Tom Fassbender says, So, Steve, Steve stabs her and you cut her neck. Brendan nods. Uh, yes. What else happens to her head? Fassbender, it's, Fassbender says, it's extremely, extremely important you tell us this for us to believe you. Investigator Mark Weigert says, come on, Brendan, what else? Then there's a pause. Then Fassbender says, we know, we know, we just know. You need to tell us. And Brendan says, that's all I can remember. Weigert says, all right, I'm just going to come out and ask you. Who shot her in the head? And Brendan says he did. So he wasn't getting there on his own. They, he didn't know. At least in my humble opinion, he didn't know. And he had to be led there by the police many times. This is just one example of when they lead the questions. So Weigert said in court that he didn't really worry about Daffy having cognitive limitations when he did the interview. Um, I think that was all I really wanted to read on here. That was, but I thought that there was some good information um, uh, for something else. I can't remember. Yeah, they gave him the false promises and all sorts of things. This is just, this continues talking about his appeal. There was something I wanted to read here. Okay. So this, if you've watched the Making a Murderer series, season two, Laura Nyrider, who is the uh, defense attorney for Brendan Daffy, she she was on that the second season and um, then we interviewed her in depth and so here is a statement that she made at the Northwestern 
Law School Center on Wrongful Convictions of Youth. So, um, what was I going to say about her? Oh, I also have um, a speech or like a presentation that her that her and the other defense attorney did that I'm going to add as part of the sequence here because I think it's really good because it explains how wrongful convictions can happen so super easily. Anyways, so she is going, or I'm just going to read her quote here, and then we'll go we'll go watch the video. I didn't mean to take up this much time. So this video of Brendan's interrogation shows a confused boy who was manipulated by experienced police officers into accepting their story of how the unaliving of Teresa Halbach happened. These officers repeatedly assured him that everything would be okay if he just told them what they wanted to hear and then fed him facts so that Brendan's confession felt or fit their theory of the crime. By the end of the interrogation, Brendan was so confused that he actually thought he was going to return to school after confessing to unaliving someone. So that is big. I mean, it goes to his mindset and where his mind was in the it, the state of mind at a time of his being it, coercing uh, them coercing this confession out of him. I mean, he didn't know. He wanted to go home and watch WrestleMania. All right, so we're gonna go finish back um, or switch back here and go to our video. Sorry about that. I will not interrupt so much. Deception indicated. Probably deception is point ninety eight. It's ninety eight percent. Well, what do you think that means? It says deception indicated. Like I said, he's a, poly a polygrapher, polygrapher, whatever, however you want to say it. He is, he does polygraph examinations. And he's going to, or he already did the, the polygraph on Brendan, and now he's lying to Brendan and saying that he failed. But that's not true. That doesn't surprise you. Let me show you some things. This is the original. It doesn't surprise you? Like, did you see how long it took him to answer that? And I have this on 1.25 speed. So if this is too fast for you, I recommend you can turn it down. But 1.25, I have to. I watch things much faster than this. I can't watch things at normal speed. I just can't. <laughs> so here we go. There's a poster for Teresa Halbeck. Okay. This is Teresa's website. This is her family. You've seen them in court, right? Okay. This is the last thing that Teresa saw. She saw this sign right here. Do you recognize that sign? What's the sign say? Okay. It's pretty quick. It's pretty quick, isn't it? And this right here. What's that picture right there? I don't think Brendan knew what that meant. First of all, prophetic. It's a big word. I mean, he might know, but he he just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I like I I think he just likes to agree with people and to because that's how you get along when you don't understand, you just be a agreeable person. And where's it going to? Okay, so Teresa sees this sign right here that says dead end, and she goes on that road. And she ends up over here at that red house, right? And whose red house is that? Okay. And then she ends up in the bedroom. The top picture like that. But before there, she has to get down the hallway, right? There are no closed captions. FYI, I would put them on if I could. I just probably can't hear them very well, so that's why I don't. Is that right? Okay. recognize this? It's inside Stevens. Can you think where that might be in his house? Okay. 
you recognize this right here? Okay. What do you think it is? Okay. Whose car is that? are we talking about here? It's not that difficult to guess. It's Teresa Hallbach's car. Who'd you think it is? Why do you think it's hers? Recognize this blue ribbon here? Okay. Maybe it looks like something like this right here. Yeah. You know what building that is right there? That's Teresa's church. Now let me tell you this, I know everything I need to know at this age, except for two things. Isn't that kind of the same tactics that the police use? I know everything I need to know. I just need to hear it from you. This guy's supposed to be helping Brendan. He's supposed to be working for Brendan's public defender. There are two things I don't know. What do you think they might be? Well, think about it. You have to put your hands on I can't, I can't hear you. Maybe if, um, so if I help them, help them. Continue. Or if I help them with any of this. Continue. Two things I don't know. And the two things I don't know is, are you sorry for what you did? Can you promise not to do it again? Those are the two things I don't know. I know everything else in the end that I need to know about this case, except for those two things. Come again? What does that have to do with anything, being a defense attorney's investigator? Being sorry doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to be arguing for his uh, rights and making sure that his rights aren't being denied in the prison system or in the government by the government. But that's exactly what they're doing. What I want you to do is make a decision. I want you to read this form, and then we're going to fill it out. Uh, you mark the boxes where you think the boxes should be marked.
you sorry. If you're Brendan, if you're not look at me. If you're not sorry, I can't help you. Wow. What I don't want you to do is spend the rest of your life in prison. Can you look at me? Do you want to spend the rest of your life in prison? If you did a very bad thing. Yeah, but I was only there for the fight, though. Brendan? You haven't told me the truth yet. Listen to me very carefully. Why don't you look at me? Brendan? Brendan, look at me, please. This is your choice. Listen very carefully. Somebody is going to cooperate and tell the truth. I would prefer it's going to be you. If it's not, because your confession has been admitted. You heard that today. Right now, they're asking for life plus 100 plus uh, what, 72 years. Now, that's your greatest exposure right now. If you tell the complete truth, the complete truth, not just part of the truth, there's a door open for you. You will still have to serve some time in prison. You don't get to go home now. Somebody died. This is your chance to tell the truth. If Steve Avery decides to get up and lie, but testifies against you, then he may get an offer and a deal with the prosecutor's office, and that's my concern. As already know, right, only the two of you know what happened inside that crime scene. You know what happened, you know why it happened, you know what time it happened. I said, I don't know if you're sorry. I don't know if you'll promise enough to do this again. Those are the two things I don't know. Steve right now is saying that, that you're to blame for part of this, and so is Bobby. Are you aware of that? Is Bobby to blame for any of this? No. Do you see the girl? Okay. Steve says that, that she and Bobby were together. Is that the truth? And how do you know it's not the truth? Because I'm friends with uh, the guy, the, the friend's brother, and they said that they go hunting together. Remember how you told Detective Weiger? His name is Mark, right? He's a pretty good guy, right? He was nice to you? Do you remember telling Mark about the bullet? Remember that? Guess what? What you described to Mark and to Special Agent Fassbender turned out to be completely true because the DNA is from Teresa is on one of the bullets in the garage on the floor. That's the bullet.
you decide to do. Check on and very sorry for all that again. That's a good beginning. Continue. Brendan, stop for a second. The last time you and I were here, what you wrote was not the truth. Do we agree with that? Well, part of the truth was that you got that day and went to school. So yes, there was some truth. He doesn't, well, he doesn't know what to say because if he tells the truth that he had nothing to do with it, then people get mad at him. <laughs> but he doesn't want to implicate himself in being involved in something that he didn't do, and he doesn't want to lie. So he's stuck between a really big rock and a very hard place <laughs> because he is really you know he's just trying to placate whoever is questioning him regarding this case because that it just seems like when he's stuck being around you're making it so difficult and it doesn't need to be there you go oh my gosh this was like three times this was down for talking really long she thought i was trying to get it on my camera <laughs> um anyways sorry so yeah this is um hard to watch this guy the way he's supposed to be helping brendan this guy does not appear to be helping brendan at all well, part of the truth was that you got that day and went to school so yes there was some truth right but everything else you said wasn't the truth and what i don't want you to do now can you look at me for a second? What I don't want you to do right now is tell me any more lies. Okay? Because if you lie to me, guess what I have to do? I have to stand up, put everything away, and leave. Because that means that you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. If you want to go to prison for the rest of your life, because you're going to hang on to some lies, then I can't tell you. How are these not considered threats? When you're all through telling the truth tonight, then you and I have to talk about something else. Can you let me know what that is? It's a good thing. You get to tell me all about your family history and what got you to this point last October 31st that caused all these problems to happen. I have to unravel all of that and ask the court to consider leniency based upon your family history and what's happened to you. I can only do all these things if you tell the truth. If you, if you say even one single lie, I cannot help you at all. So you're going to make a decision before you start writing anything. You're going to write the complete truth, no matter what the truth is. Because then Mike can help you. If you write a lie, then Mike can't help you at all. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, do you spend the rest of your life in prison? So is that a yes or a no?
can't hear you. You want me to try and help you? I specialize in working with folks like yourself to make sure that you don't go to prison for the rest of your life. Do you want to get out and have a family someday? Well, that means you have to cooperate with me and help me help me work with you. How much you cooperate, how much you help me, will depend upon what happens with you. really seems to feel like um, he's got to push Brendan <laughs> negative uh, pushback I don't know he's not very nice Right now he's filling out his self-interview, which I was trying to find. I thought I downloaded it.
been spelling that out. it and let's swap I don't know right here all right this is his self interview that he just that this is what he's spilling out right now so you start from the beginning and continue Alright, so this story is that me and Blaine, my brother, came home from school at 3.45 p.m. about and walked down our driveway and went into the house and Blaine went to get the phone and called his friend Jason to see if he was going trick-or-treating. And then at 5.30 p.m. Uh, went up the road to go with Jason and picked him up. My mom came home when Blaine was walking up the driveway. Blaine was halfway to the mailbox to get picked up when mom came home. The mo then mom left home at 6 p.m. to go shopping with Scott. That's the stepdad. I was in my room playing PlayStation 2 and got a call from Blaine's boss and I told him that he was gone that he was was gone trick or treating with a friend. He told me to tell Blaine to call his boss when he got back home around 11.30. I then went back to my game and played it for an hour or so and got a phone call from Steven at home or so. Wait, no. I just read the same line again. Okay, so got a call from Steven at home that if I wanted to come over to the bonfire and help him with burning tires and branches and wood, van seat, a cabinet, and we used the golf cart to carry the stuff over to the fire. So that was his original statement. If you go back to the police interview, number one of six, that is what he said they were doing. And that is, he's been, he's stuck to that since the beginning. All right, so... Then Mom and Scott came home from shopping at 8.30, and then she called Stephen on his cell phone and told him I was to be home at 9.30 to 10, and she asked him if I had a sweater on because it was cold that day. I went home at 9.30 and watched TV for an hour or so, and Mom told me it was bedtime. I did so and went to bed. And yeah, and went to bed and woke up at 7 a.m. for school. That is the true story. That is the true story. So that's probably the first thing that he's writing right now. Because <laughs> that's the beginning of it. And as we continue, we'll see that he has to draw things. my detailed drawings the bus, the garage, Blaine mom coming and leaving at 6 so he had to do all these drawings then if you're going to conduct this investigation describe in detail each step that you w w would that you would do during this investigation to determine what and how this happened. Just so Brendan says, I would start at the beginning and start by asking the family questions that if she talked about going away or something like that, or try to find the real life under or, or kidnapper and find out why people say they seen her at a place they were like at a store and restaurant. I don't know what that means. And there's rumors that she was seen other places. All right, so now list each of the five most important causes that may have created this situation. Listen to that. And um, you may continue on to your next page after you provide your five reasons below. Take your time. There, there are 
five reasons why this incident happened do not include to your next page unless you have written your five. Okay. Uh, then I continue on. All right. So please write five of your reasons before you can continue to the next page. Start from the beginning. Number one. These are the reasons why this happened. Number one, that Manitowoc is trying to set Stephen up for ending her because one day he's seen taillights down by him and uh, uh, the day, uh, wait, wait, of the day, Stephen went to the store with Chucky. So it's the same day. Remember, we he said he saw taillights. He said it in his interview with police. He said it... Um, in other interviews, like recorded m media interviews, that there were taillights and that he thinks he's being set up. Now, mind you, they are asking, why do you think this crime happened in the first place? And he's saying it's because Manitowoc County is mad at Stephen and they're after him. One. Oh, Chucky. I, s I read that wrong, right? Because Chucky saw... One Chucky seen headlights by his house the day after that. Oh, so the day after the crime, Chucky then saw headlights by his house. Now, the real killer put the car down in the Avery's yard maybe because they didn't like them. It's a very good, very good observation, 16-year-old Daffy with um, not a criminal, uh, you know, investigation background, but yet it makes sense. The person could have put the car there because they didn't like the Averys and they wanted to pin it on them. I mean, that's a big possibility and anyone could have done it. They had, I guess, a car, like, a, but it was an empty shell of a car it was like emptied out all the engine and all the material was out of it so but that's what they had blocking the entrance way there and somebody went um somebody may have pushed it easily the car that was blocking it because it was a shell of a car it wasn't actually anything inside of it all right so and then finally that one is trying to put the avery name in a bad situation i don't know all right, describe in detail what you did during the day before this person was harmed. Um, I don't know what the day before has anything to do with. So let me see if we've got, I'm sure he doesn't remember. He's a while from when this happened now. So describe in detail what you did during the day. And he already went through this. He says he went to school and played PlayStation and went to the bonfire, bomb fire at 6.30 and helped Stephen to clean up the yard. And we did that for two hours until mom came home, got a call on Stephen's cell phone and talked to mom about me being home at 9.30 to 10. Then at 9.30, I went home and watched TV with mom, then went to bed at 10. I mean... How much more, how many more times does he have to be that clear about what he did? And this is, again, the day after. They're just kind of split them up by making them repeat it and then have to, have to, you know, account for any inconsistencies and things like that. These are more pictures they make him draw. Here's the bonfire back of Steve's garage, a golf cart, there they are, there's the tires. I mean, why even, why do you need these pictures? What are they good for? Now thinking about your written information in the survey so far, would you like to make a change about any of your information? No, I don't. <laughs> All right, uh, have you held back anything? No. Did you truthfully explain why this person suffered the fatal injuries? Explain in detail. Yes, because me and Stephen didn't do it. What could you have done that would have prevented the fatal injuries? Nothing, because he and I didn't do it. What are three reasons that this occurred? Because Stephen was su suing the Manitowoc police 
because he didn't do the thing that he was in jail for 18 years ago, and because the police hated him. Explain. Because he was suing them. I mean, this kid gets it. <laughs> I don't know why the Manitowoc County police don't get it and why they should have never been on Avery Park property in the first place, but they were planting keys and things and evidence. Did you write any false information inside any of your questions in this survey? He says, no. How you feel now that you have almost completed the survey? He says, good. <laughs> Should we believe your answers? He says, yes. If your answer to the last question was yes, give us a reason why. Because it is the truth and the right thing to do. Even though this guy is telling him, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. You need to change your story. I don't believe you. He's still sticking to, this is what happened. I went to the bonfire. I came home. That was my day. We didn't see Teresa. She was gone. So, I don't know. All right. So, what would you say if it was later determined that you lied in the survey? He would say that my survey is the truth and it is the true story. When filling out this survey, what were your emotions? That I missed my family and friends, that I don't get to see my friends. Okay, sad. Were you afraid while completing this? I would say yeah, because of the way that the guy was talking to him, but I mean, he could have been lying. All right, so. Um, something about counseling or money, I don't know. If you have direct connection to this incident, you may be asked to take a lie detector test, which he just did. Um, what test questions should be asked in a lie detector test about this incident? Did I help Stephen and her? Did I see a body in the fire? Was my statement I gave the investigators true? Explain in detail what a lie detector test could prove. That if I was telling the truth or not, which is the truth, meaning, you know, which uh, he was telling the truth, but um, he wants to prove one way or another. Please move my ears. I, the iPad's my ears up. Um, he wants to be able to prove that he um, that the investigators coerced the confession out of him. Uh, write a letter below and write a full explanation why your name should be removed from or kept on the list of suspects as to who participated in the unaliving of this person. So he said, did your mom and dad take my name off the list of suspects because I did not do anything wrong and that I am not guilty of this thing? Mom and Dad, I'm telling the truth, and I got people that believe me. Take my name off of the list of untruthful people. This is such a dumb experiment, but okay. Since nobody tells everybody everything that they need, that they know, how much have you told us on this survey? He says 100%. All right. Um, let's see. So, do you think the person who is not telling the truth about this incident deserves a second chance? He says, yes. Why? Because maybe if they do, they would come out with it. Number two, how can we help the person feel better? Let them be with their family and friends. Why will the person admit their mistake? To make the right decision. To do the right thing. Uh, all right, so for who will the person admit their mistake to, family members or friends? Why? Because they like their family and friends. Five, when will the person admit their mistake? I don't know. But then he didn't leave a reason for why. He said, or the question is, do you think the person or persons who is not telling the truth about this incident will admit their mistake? He says, maybe. And why? Because to set the stuff straight. That's what he says. All right, so please write in detail what you would like to be written in in the report about you. Oh, what? 
What would you like written in the report about you and the incident? Start from the beginning. That I am not guilty and that I could not end someone or something like an animal. If I see BLWG or when I get a needle put in the knee, I will faint or have a blackout like on a field trip to the hospital in 8th grade. I went into a room with friends and when I seen the BLWOG packs, I had a blackout. So you're telling me that he sliced her neck open, but yet he can't see medical packs of BLWOG without wanting to pass out. But he had a hand in this violent, horrific crime that would have been BLWOGY. Very, very BLWOGY. Um, which would have left a lot of remnants and there were none none of Teresa Hallbuck the, the bullet that they found I'm just gonna go into that now so the bullet that they found supposedly had Teresa's DNA on it I definitely think it was either contaminated or um, staged to have her DNA on it because the amount of DNA was like 10 times the amount of DNA that would normally come from uh, a bullet fragment that passed through a human brain and supposedly the DNA on there you know it was so concentrated and intense especially for like this tiny little minute amount so it and when analyzing the bullet very up close um, Kathleen Zellner, Zellner noticed waxy material on there which could have possibly been chapstick, which they took Teresa Hall. The police took into custody Teresa's chapstick for DNA purposes. So there's that. But anyway. All right. So he says that he is not guilty and that I could not hurt an animal. He, oh, and he faints out at the sight of BLWG. But we're supposed to believe that he slit the throat of this woman after brutally attacking her and this kid who doesn't even look like he could hurt a fly. What else about this investigation? We haven't asked you yet, and when we do ask you, what will you tell us? Start from the beginning. He says, I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Declaration, Brendan Dassey, 4-16-06. Uh, Brendan Dassey, 1102. So, let's continue. Oh, I need to get my thing here. to go I need to go too far what's happening is he are you talking
Okay, here we go. I knew we came back and they started popping up here. Where is the volume? All the Can you guys hear? Did I bump it? What's going on? Why is it silent? Come on, I'm already like an hour into the stream. I don't want to. I'm so confused. Why did my volume just stop working? Do that again. This is so frustrating. <laughs> it annoys you. Why is it not working? Okay, where is it? Push her down here. Okay. Of you cutting her hair. Sorry, I don't know why it just suddenly stopped working. The volume. Um, that was annoying. But here we go. We're back on track. And what do you have right there? What's that? What's next to it? Was he watching? Okay. And where'd you stab her at? And cut her hair? In the house or in the garage? I cut her hair in the house. Stabbed her outside. Okay. Was she alive when you stabbed her? Why'd you stab her then? Where did she actually die at? In the garage. So she was alive in the garage when you took her out there? Was she screaming? Yeah. What was she saying? Her exact words. Okay. Draw a picture down here of you cutting her hair. Remember the police did this to him too like draw yourself here doing this draw her on the bed so anything that he's drawing is because they're telling him to do it so it's not I don't know I just don't think that it's it's so frustrating to, to watch this poor kid
Mercy Center. Is she in the bedroom or in the room in the bed or where? She didn't get up from the bed. So she was tied down. What was she tied down with? Was any of this in his statement? Was any of this in his story? No. <laughs> because it didn't happen. What else? Cuffs. What kind of cuffs? Light cuffs. I'm sorry? Light cuffs. I don't know what you mean. So they had chains? Okay. Okay, why don't you do this? Why don't you draw a picture of, of the bed and how she was tied down? But draw, draw a big size so we can see it. It's just going to draw whatever you say to draw. So how should I draw a chain? I don't know. How, I didn't see it, so I can't help you. Chained also. What do you think was there? Rope. Okay, go ahead and put the rope in. Was she wearing clothes at this time? No. Where were her clothes at? On the floor. Can you put them where they were? What is that? Pants and a shirt. Okay. What about shoes? <laughs> you gotta draw shoes too? It's ridiculous. Okay. Anything else? Is this the bed that she was tied to? Where did the rope go to? Can you show me here? Right here. Okay, why don't you put an X right there then? And then what about the other side? Okay. What was she saying when she was tied up like this? Stephen say? Hey, what did he tell her? That if you would better go 
What else did he say? How long was he playing this? What's your idea? Why do you think that? Because um, for some days he couldn't control his temper, so the whole family told him to go see the people that you go talk to about your feelings and that. And he, he got pissed off and he went for the ride. What time did you go to the trailer that day? The real time. So you were cutting her hair and having sex with her after eight o'clock? So she was alive until then? How do you know she was in the trailer? And what happened next? He showed me her and then told me to have sex with her. Continue. Continue. Then after I was done, I cut off her, he told me to cut some hair off, and then when we were done, we took her off and we sprung her outside. Into the garage and then he stabbed her and then shot her. How did you get from the bed to the garage? He carried her. How? In his hand. Describe it. Because he had the gun in his hand. Where'd he get the gun from? How's he holding her and holding a gun? Does it make sense? In the bedroom. What kind of a gun was it? Twenty-two. Okay. 
what was she saying while this was happening? Saying not to do it and to let her go. And how come she didn't run away? She was trying to. What was she doing? Experiment trying to get away from him. What stopped her from getting away? She was holding it too tight. And what else? She was tied up. How was she tied up? Her feet were tied in her hands. I'm going to draw a picture right here about how she was tied up. Was she wearing any clothes? No. What happens next? When he stabs her and then he shoots her and then he put her into the fire. And she was still alive when you put her in the fire? No. How do you know? Because she wasn't moving. When did she stop moving? When he shot her. And where did he shoot her at? In the stomach. Anywhere else? In the heart. In where? In the heart. In the heart? And how do you know he shot her in the heart? Did you see him shoot her? No, because I can't look at that so. How do you know he shot her then? Because I heard the gunshot. Maybe he was shooting at you. What was she saying while he was shooting her? What did she sound like exactly? Stop what he was doing. Was there blood in the garage? Yeah. Whose blood was it? Hers. And how do you know it was her blood? How many times do you think he shot her? Five times. And why do you think five? That's how much shots I heard. Was the fire already going in the, in the pit? Yes. Yeah. Was it a small fire? Not really. How did she get in? How did she get, get in the fire? He carried her. And 
And where's the knife that he used for scabbard? Where'd you last see it? In the garage. Where in the garage? Right behind the lawnmower. Behind the lawnmower? Was it hidden? No. It was just laying on the floor. Describe the knife to me. Let's draw a picture of the knife. How's that? The bigger, the better, so you can have details. Uh, Just draw it how you think it should be. Describe these parts, what they look like. Like the color? Everything, sure. And how long is it? Is the whole thing eight inches? Okay. And where'd it come from? On the phone. Okay, where in the house? From the kitchen. Did you see that? No. How do you know it came from the kitchen? She was still tied up on the bed. You went in the kitchen and got it. Okay. Go ahead and put it from the kitchen then. Where's the first place that she was stabbed at? In the garage. Okay. When did you know he was going to kill her? Did they tell you he's going to burn her? Did she know that she was going to burn her? Did he tell her? Did she hear him say that he was going to burn her? How many times did he have sex with her? What did he tell you about him having sex with her? And did he have sex with her then? Any, any sex toys on her? Do you know what a sex toy is? It's something that you put in the girl's vagina. It vibrates sometimes. Was that used on her that day? Was anything used on her at all? No. Okay. Did you see him touch her at all? Just to pick her up off the bed, man. Okay.
and she was in the garage. Where was her car? <coughs> Wasn't in the garage? What was in the garage besides Teresa, Steve, and you? Just a snowmobile in the garage. The snowmobile, was it? Was the snowmobile uh, on the trailer? Okay. And the lawnmower. Is it a riding lawnmower? Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Why don't you draw a picture of the garage where you were, where Teresa was, where Steve was, and where the lawnmower and the snowmobile was placed? Can I just draw a square? Sure. sure. But draw a big picture so you can see. Yeah, I need a lawnmower. Okay, sure. Everybody can see this? So the garage door is open. How about this door right here? Is that open? Just a little bit. Okay. And what's happening over here? Just when you set it on the floor. Have it over there too. How many times? Once. Where at? And where did he stab her at? Do you think she was in a lot of pain? Yeah. Why do you think she was in a lot of pain? She's saying. She was crying. How much? A lot. What do you call a lot? Where two and are always going on one after another. How long was she crying? Continue. And then after that, we could go outside and put it on the fire. Continue. Stephen on his cell phone told him that I would have to be home at 10 o'clock and she asked if I had a sweater on.
continue. Yeah, it was at nine o'clock about, and so we waited for a little bit, and then the fire went down, and so well, actually, we threw some stuff on there, and we waited for the fire to go down, and when we did, when that did, that was about like ten o'clock. So Stephen told me that I should go home and go to bed. So I did. When I got home, I talked to my mom a little bit, like how her day was and that. Then I went to sleep. Did you just like pretty good that night? Not really. Explain. Well, I only got three hours of sleep. Because at school, I was. I was in my uh, third hour class and then like in the middle of third hour everybody was laughing because my head was like bobbing, bobbing down like What was Steve saying while she was in the fire burning? Not much. What were his words? That I should keep my mouth shut. Continue. Where was the Suzuki at when all this was happening? The uh, Grace Suzuki? Yes. On the side of the garage. Right here. Okay. How did he get her car dead, down to the pit? Oh. I heard that, yeah, that the Chuck and her own was down there. Like that. Let me show you. Do you, know you know where the car was found? I see a fish here. Why don't you walk over here? I can show you. You see right there? Yeah. I think the car was in the middle of the road facing that way. This is the bottom. How how we get to Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry I'm here. Back. Back on camera, yeah, but I'm here. Okay. I want you to take a red pen and this is the garage. Okay, put the word garage there, and then so we know it's a garage. Okay, and what time is she over here? Oh, yes, please. And then put the name of the person here and the name of each one of these people here, please. How do you spell it? However you think it should be spelled. Okay, good. Okay, and then <coughs> this was the knife that was used to stab her. Go ahead and write that and so we know what it is. Did he say, go ahead and say that it is? Hold on. 
and go ahead and write that pencil away, not what it is. This was the knife that was used to stab her. Go ahead and write that pencil away, not what it is. Oh, go ahead and write that so we know on what it is. And put it in there. Okay. And then describe what these things are. Please. What does that say? Okay. And, and who's this person here? Go ahead and, and write what put everything else, please. Okay. And what's this down here? happening with her. And where'd the rope come from? The rope came from here. Yes. Where, where did this rope come from? In the garage. Okay, where, can you describe the rope? You can start with what color it is. How do you know it came from the garage? Because he had uh, quite a few ropes in the garage. I thought he told him law enforcement in one of his interviews that it was um, like a laundry rope, like a thin white rope that you would use to hang out your laundry. Because that was what the officer said it was. And he was like, yeah, he agreed. And now this, now he's saying when he's got to come up with the color that it's yellow. So, I mean, there's another inconsistency in Brendan's statements here. I mean, there's many, but, you know. This and sometimes when I go over there. Describe what these things over here are, please. And whose are these? Okay. Three is closed. And what happened to them? How do you know that? Because that's what we use to turn up the reddish black stuff. Explain. Like you would tell that the bleach in there and the reddish flash where the blood was, and you would use the blood to try to get it. Whose clothes were they using? Okay. How do you know it was her clothes? They told me to grab them. And did you? And where'd you get them from? I'm right there in the floor. So, wh where was he when he told you to grab the clothes? He was right here doing, <coughs> grabbing her. And what was she doing while he was grabbing her? How was she trying to get away? Trying to swim out of his, his grip. Were you holding her also? No. Not even for a minute? Why not? I was grabbing close to the shoes. And what was she saying?
she begging for mercy? Yeah. What was she saying? She crying there also? Yeah. How much? Did she mention God? Mm -hmm. Did she ever mention God no. before she died? Did she mention anybody's names before she died? No. Do you think she knew she was dying? What time was this when you first saw her? Now over here you wrote 835. Does that sound right? What's the first time that you knew that she was in there? And that's what that, that time is? What did you do from 5.30 until like 15? After that, I watched TV and then I got a phone call at 6 from Blaine the Boss. And at 7, I got a phone call from Steven, but I didn't go over there right away or so. And he called again to see where I was, and I told him I was getting ready. Go ahead and put the times, what these things are, what each picture is. What do you mean, like, what time this is? Sure. And also what it is. The pictures that you made him draw. Why didn't you tell anybody? I wasn't afraid to. Afraid of what? Afraid that the family won't like me. 
Which family? My father. Why wouldn't they like you anymore? They were listening to you. What was Stephen wearing when you when you first went into her in his house? been consistent with that the whole time he's been wearing a white that he was wearing a white shirt and red shorts so he has consistent memories but like at what point wh at what point are these memories like falsely implanted or if he's just coerced to say them is the problem because he thinks it'll get him out of whatever situation he's in uh. What happened to those clothes? Did you burn anything else in the in the pit besides Teresa and her clothes? Just tires, a cat that wore and a van suit. Okay, I just asked you what else do you think is important that we should know and what you come up with? Oh, I thought you were going to start to tell me something. Huh? I thought you were going to start to tell me something. What I didn't know what oh. Let's see. Okay, sir, for you. Read, please. Yes, please. Just take your time. I'm looking up, trying to find like correlations between people with low IQs or with disabilities, learning disabilities, language impairment disabilities, how they can be easily give easily influenced to give false confessions so i might do a follow-up um just on my show not even in relation to the stephen avery case but just how people can easily become um innocent people can easily become manipulated into giving a false confession uh, this uh, this topic fascinates me because it happens and people don't believe. Like, why would anyone confess to something that they didn't do? Well, if you were in a pr in in a room with two officers for hours on end, get not given food, not given water, not given your basic rights or whatever, and you're um, being constantly berated and told we know you're lying and we have proof that something else happened and you're not telling us the truth even though you know the truth but they keep telling you that so it gets to your head just like he said they got to my head at the end of that interview with the police on the first of march so yeah it's that easy someone could very easily be manipulated but anyways let's move on i'll do a follow-up on this because this topic fascinates me Hi, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. This is Michael Kelly. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm with Brandon right now, and we're in the GED room of the, of the facility. Um, and he's given a detailed statement. Uh, my next question to you would be that uh, would you like me to call a special agent prosecutor and have him interview uh, Brandon at this time? So that's where Agent Fassbender comes in, and he, or at least you, the next 
police interview comes in. Why do they need to keep interviewing this poor kid? Don't they have enough on him? Why do they keep interviewing him? Oh, quite well. Quite well. Quite well. Very well. Hear that? It went well. Quite well. Very well. Let me let me get clearance from the uh, from the jailer. Otherwise, I can't get him the phone. I believe he's on the phone with Len Kaczynski, by the way, saying like, "Very good, very good. This session went very good because he got Brendan to confess all the things that he needed, because he led him to all of the confessions and told him to draw the things." Um, I've got the attorney on my cell phone, and he'd like to talk to uh, to Brendan Dask. Is that possible? Okay. You want to walk down and have an answer? That sounds fine. This is it's Brendan Dask's attorney. And, and I, I can also pass the phone to you folks to get verified. I will. That's fine. Okay, they're going to check with the supervisor, and then they're going to walk down. Couldn't believe it. The um, the, the, the driver's side uh, tire uh, slipped the slit at the rim uh, about about 18 inches, so it's about halfway around the tire. Yeah, three three hundred and sixty dollars for one tire. Couldn't believe it. I'm sorry. Yes, no, well, I, I had a BMW, and 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 you can point to say BMW and they double the price. Yes, they are. Yes. I was fortunate I was able to get the tires on and get down here now. This is a nice jail facility. Oh, sure, definitely. I can't believe this guy is having all these conversations while Brendan's sitting there doing this. That after he was basically forced to write all this down. And I know people are going to say, well, it wasn't forced, but when you think that you don't have any other choice because this person of authority, it, you're 16, you don't know that you have the option to say, no, I'm not going to do this, or no, I'm not doing what you asked me to do. And when he's, he's still a child and he thinks that he needs to listen to authorities, and even if those authorities happen to be polygraph examiners and sleazy defense attorneys who really just want to see him fry because it's a high profile case then I don't know it's been quite well Let us talk to you. Oh. Nice talking to Len. Blend talking? Okay. 
we can do so much to, to save him. That won't do any good, though. That won't do any good, just so you know. Would you mind if I, if I visited with him a little bit more? And explain to him the value? And if there's a change, um, I'll call you back then. That sounds fine? Thanks very much. Thanks, Lloyd. for the state. What that? Look what for the state. What do you mean? It says declared all under and and see or of the jury under the laws of the state of What state are you in, do you think? Wisconsin. Okay. Let's talk uh, for a few minutes. What do I do here? What do I have to do that? No, you don't have to at all. Just hold on. Yes, please. Okay, I'll explain this to you so you understand. You're writing a truthful story, am I correct? You're writing a truthful story to help yourself? Okay. You realize that you're not going to go home by writing the truth, right? Okay. You realize that what you did was wrong, and you're sorry for it, right? Okay. You realize that you're going to have to go to prison for some period of time, right? Okay. I would also like you to testify against Steve Avery. And that's the right thing to do. You agree? Yeah. Okay. You pretty much told me the same story as you told the police. Okay. And I'd like you to work with the police and tell them the truth. Let's see what this is. It might be here. Let me. Polygraph, can we help you? My concern is for you, and I'd like you to cooperate with the police department. They want to interview you also, if, you, if you'll let them, and if you work with them, I feel comfortable that the Hallback family will also support you for doing the right thing. This is the time in your life that you can turn around and do as much as you can to right as much as you've been wrong. You can't bring Teresa back, but you can certainly do the right thing in her memory. Do you agree? Okay. And if Teresa were alive right now, she'd want you to testify against Avery. Right? And she'd want you to tell the truth to the police department. And would you like me to be there when you talk with the police? No. I'm more than willing to, to be with you when, when you tell the police the story. They might want to come over tonight, if you'll let them.
is pretty important for Teresa. I don't know. How would you feel if we came over in the morning? Would that be okay with you? Happy at breakfast? How long would it take for? I don't know. Not as long as you and I took, because now that you've got the truth out, now it's easy. Why the heck does he need another interview? And why... Why is this guy so... Mm, slimy? <laughs> I don't know. Call in and tell him. Would you like Lynn to be here too? Don't mind me. Okay. Yeah, it's, Lynn should be there. Hi, Lynn. This is Mike. Uh, Brenda would like to watch uh, watch a TV show tonight. He has something that he wants to see on TV. So he'd like to uh, forego tonight, and he said after breakfast tomorrow morning would be fine. Uh, the, the interview by law enforcement would can occur after breakfast tomorrow morning. Yes, I will. Okay. Perfect. Of course, yes. This evening. Yeah. I, I think it'd be easier for Brendan to to visit with them, um, use, using this uh, u, u, using the statement here. It'd be, it'd be easier on Brendan than it would be to start all over again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds great, Len. Thank you very much. Take care. Yes, this is Michael O'Kelly calling for Special Agent Fassbender. Oh. Hi there. Hi there. I'm inside the, uh, the Sheboygan County Jail facility, and I'm uh, sitting here with Brendan, and we've had several conversations with the attorney, and Brendan would like to visit with you folks. Um, he'd like to watch a movie tonight, so he said if you can come by, come by tomorrow morning after breakfast. And um, he's also prepared a document for, for me, and it'll be up to you if you want a copy or not. Len mentioned that uh, uh, discovery issues and let you make that decision. Let you make that decision if you want, if you want it or not. Okay. And, and, and this is what he suggested. Uh, he suggested you send him an email and he'll confirm everything in writing for you. Th that, that way you'll have the authorization in writing.
Okay, I'll get up and I'll call him right back now. I understand. I understand. That sounds fine. Take care. Yeah, it's uh, 427 4671 uh, 920. And just let him know when he's going to, uh, if you ask him to give me a call, he decides to in the morning, and I'll meet him uh, at, at the um, at Sheboygan County facility. All right? Thanks so much. Take care. What else do you think? Who moved the Suzuki down into the pit? Who moved your mom's van down into the pit? I didn't know it was going to pit. Yeah, because they're both down there. Did, Steve, did, did Teresa ever come near the Suzuki? Who else knows that he killed him? Your grandmother? What does she think? That he went to her. And her own Chuck, what do they think? I know what, what you did. I had a little bit before, after the uh, first interview. How much did you tell him? Before the interview? So far. Well, when we went to uh, Fox Hill, so first, after the first interview, we were telling him why he had uh, come up to Fox Hill and there. That's pretty much it. So when, was that in November? No, it was February. February. So you didn't tell Brendan uh, Blaine until February? Mm -hmm. Did you tell him you had, you had, you had sex with her too? What did you tell him? I had pulled her out by the fire. Was her body in that fire? I didn't tell him. Yeah. Her body was in there. He knows, he knows that you were there when, when she died, right? I think he does. And why do you think that? Did you also tell him things? Did you tell him things about Teresa that day? No. Who else have you told besides, besides me? No. You don't tell anybody else at all? But when I made it forth, when they, they questioned my mom, you know, and they asked her if I was losing weight and depressed, and she said she didn't know, but it wasn't because of this. What was it? It was because I was trying to impress my girlfriend, but then when I met her, she broke up with me. So, 
people were saying because Brendan was losing weight, it was because he was so stressed and he couldn't handle the stress of carrying this deep secret within him and all that. So, um, yeah, he was he he deliberately lost weight because of a girlfriend or a girl that he was interested in. I'm not really sure what their relationship was or whatever because he just said they met, but um, they were, they just met. So maybe they had a relationship online and then whatever. He wanted to lose weight for her, to, to look good for her. It, 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 it's a normal 16-year-old thing to do, to want to impress someone of the opposite sex. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're guilty of a crime. But after that, I was feeling sad. And then, like, two weeks after that, I went by my friend's house. And he said that he knew another girl that would like to go over me. And then the Wednesday when they arrested me, that's when, that day I was going to go see her. How many times have you thought about committing suicide? Never. What about hanging, hanging in the garage? Mm -hmm. One of your friends told me that you did. That you were thinking about committing suicide. That you told him. talking to my friend about his future job. Because he wanted to be a suicide bomber. Yeah, who's that? Travis. And who was even a suicide bomb? I don't know. He said that was one of his careers that he wanted to do. Was he thinking about suicide bombing the school? No. He's been having some difficulty with the school, you know. Mostly everybody at school has a problem for school. Do you feel better right now? Thing. Do you still have my card? Mm -hmm. But it kind of sucks up here because if I wanted to call my friend and talk to him, I couldn't unless I ordered a phone card. At first I could, I could but then after this one day I couldn't. Oh. It says it's restricted or something. What are you going to watch tonight on TV? How come you knew about her plates being, being, being taken off her car? You didn't? You told the police that?
do you think should happen to you? What do you call quite a few years? Like 10, 15. What if they gave you 20 years? Would that be fair for what you've done? sentenced to life in prison with the earliest possibility of parole in 2048. 2048. And that is what he actually did get. It's better than life without, without parole, isn't it? Do you think you can keep this between you and I and Lynn right now and not tell your family at all, your mom or anybody? Anything you want to ask me? No, you can always call me collect, right? Okay. Can I take this with you? Something that Teresa's? like a piece of her clothing or something that he just handed to her to him and was like do you want this it's something of Teresa's how weird let's do this let's go ahead and stop for this evening and then unless you have, you have any questions you want to ask me anything you want to say okay and then uh, we'll probably come back in the morning and we'll just go from there Thanks for doing the right thing. I think you made a good choice. I think you're going to feel better, too. You'll be hard-facing Steve, but if you want me there, I'll be there when you, when you face him. In court. And you don't have to worry. He can't get to you. He can't hurt you. That is like at least a few more seconds left. Just come back in. Okay. Yeah, we're good for now. All right. So there and there he gets taken off. He's going to have to unmute while we talk later. Um. Yeah. So that was it. Um. At this point, it's prob. This is probably for sentencing. I'm. I'm assuming. Um, now that he's been convicted, so they're probably doing this to see how much time, to determine how much time they should um, give him, and uh, as we know, it was life without parole until 2048, which he'll be an old man by then. Uh, Alright, so, well, maybe not an old man, but an, uh, he will definitely be an older gentlemen by then. 
All right, so that was it for this episode. We're the next episode. We're going to watch the final police interview. I believe. Hold on. I don't know if that's a watch or a audio. Um, 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 that is video. So number six of six. We're going to watch. And then I have a little fun um, episode for you planned after that. Like I said, um, Laura Nerider had, um, and the, I remember the other gentleman's name, and it escapes me. Uh, But she, um, she does a presentation about wrongful conviction, so we'll watch that. It's, um, it's a pretty interesting listen. All right, so on that note, thank you so much for watching. Please take care. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye now. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeandcourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.